again I apologize for um, this shitty background, my bed just isn't that aesthetically pleasing. Hey guys, what's up? My name is Sky Webb and I'm here to talk about a true crime story that I can't get off my mind. Before I get started, I just want to put out a little disclaimer that I mean no harm to any of the victims or the victim's family and I wish everyone who was hurt within this story the utmost peace and solace, either in rest or in recovery. I just like popped out of this shirt. Like I'm just in my pajamas, I'm sorry. Got my dressing gown, it's real comfy. Anyway, moving on, this Thursday's true crime video is all about the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Pretty creepy name straight off the bat in my opinion but he has that name for good reason as i said this one's kind of fucked up so if you're not into dismemberment of any kind probably not the video for you this time so the mad butcher was an unidentified serial killer who was pretty heavily active in cleveland in the 1930s so his killings were characterized by the dismemberment Dismemberment? Dismemberment. I can't speak. I like, hi, if you haven't watched me before, I'm dumb as fuck. I don't know how to speak. And if you do watch me, like, you just know. You know. I'm dumb. You get it. Okay? You get it. The dismemberment of 12 known victims. It's suspected that there were more victims, but it's hard to tell. Back in the 1930s, things were a lot harder to investigate. They didn't have the science that they do now, and so things get a little bit murky, but it's suspected that there may have been up to 20 to 50 to even 60 different murders. We just aren't 100% sure, but there's 12 murders actually accredited to him to this day. So despite a pretty heavy investigation actually run by a famous lawman, Elliot Ness, the murderer was never apprehended. And I'll get into Elliot a little bit later. He plays kind of an interesting part in this. So most of the victims were drifters or sort of people with low income or shady sort of people as well. The majority of them were actually unidentified. And the reason for this is just because sometimes it took almost years to actually discover these bodies. So back in the 1930s, obviously without the science, it made it really hard to actually even identify people. Of course, there were some exceptions, victims two, three, and eight. <coughs> Bless me. Victims two, three, and eight were identified and I'll get into that in a minute. So as I said, the victims all appeared to be kind of lower class drifters, people who weren't often reported missing or weren't often missed. And that's another reason why it often took so long to even find their bodies because no one knew to look for them. So the butcher always beheaded his victims. He often dismembered them. So for those of you who don't know and just a little bit when they had like I am dismembered just means like they cut certain body parts off like they just cut shit off basically but they say dismembered a lot and they say beheaded a lot and i kind of thought that was the same thing but it's not really necessarily the same thing because they're different things and like normal people should know that and like i should know that because i do this like a lot and i hear about this a lot so i should just know that but i don't know that and now i'm just rambling because i don't really want to talk about the creepy stuff right now because i'm kind of creeped out if you can't tell but I'ma keep going. So in many of these cases, the actual cause of death was the beheading or this dismember, which means that the butcher did it while they were still alive and that's what killed them, which is a really scary thought because a lot of the time when it comes to mutilating bodies, it usually occurs after death and it's just like this sick thing that they wanted to do. But for the butcher, it was different. He clearly did this while they were still alive, which is just insane. So most of the male victims were castrated and some victims showed evidence of their body being chemically treated which basically just means he was fucking with them, playing around with them, most likely for the fun of it. So this Elliot Ness guy, he was basically in charge of the fire department and the police department and like the council so he was like the head of Cleveland basically. But that being said, he didn't actually have a lot of involvement 
in the investigation, he didn't actually spend a lot of his time and effort and resources going into it, but he was sort of the face of it because everyone knew him. He was like the, the head guy. And so every time something was said about the case, it involved him, even though he wasn't the one putting the work into it. He did, however, step in at one point to arrest and interrogate one suspect, Dr. Francis E. Sweeney. Now, there's a couple of different reasons why people think that he might have stepped in for this particular instance. And most people believe that he did this because Dr. Francis E. Sweeney was related to Elliot Ness's political, uh, like, enemies. What's the word for that? I know there's a word for it because I was about to say it, but now I don't know what I was saying. So his enemies, I guess, like his, his opposition. It's probably a better word for it. So people kind of think that he did this as a way to sort of publicize the fact that his opponents were related to someone who's like this crazy butcher murderer, but that hadn't been proved yet. So it was a little bit messy on his part. He probably shouldn't have done that for that reason, but we don't know. But we don't know whether or not that's why he did it. It's just sort of a conspiracy theory as to why he stepped in at this one particular moment. Another time that he did step in was when he actually went so far as to burn down the Kingsbury Run. So a lot of people have theories as to why he did this as well. Some people think he genuinely was just trying to help as the Kingsbury Run is where the butcher sort of got all of his victims from because that's where all the lower class people and the drifters and whatever else went to. So a lot of people did believe in him and thought that he was doing it to uh, keep people safe. But then there was also a fair few people who thought that he did it as sort of a classist thing where he didn't like the drifters, he didn't like the lower economic class people and he didn't want them in town so again the fact that he was the head of Cleveland made it very murky waters because people always assumed there was sort of a political drive behind it rather than just trying to find this murderer so this butcher guy he was a very interesting character so he was actually very interested in Elliot Ness and everything to do with the investigation, everything that was publicized. And he sort of saw Elliot Ness as like his nemesis. He sort of saw him as this guy who was constantly saying he was gonna get him and he was gonna find him and he was gonna do this and that and whatever else. And so the butcher actually found quite a lot of pleasure in taunting Elliot Ness. And one instance of this is where he actually placed two beheaded heads, literally just placed two heads outside uh, Elliot Ness's office at Town Hall. So when he walked into his office and sat down, he would see these two decapitated fucking heads staring at him, which is so traumatizing. <laughs> Fuck that. But this is what he did. He liked to fuck with people. He wanted to scare him or taunt him or he just wanted to fuck with him. He just wanted to fuck with him. So I'll tell you a little bit about the victims. I can't go into huge detail for the fact that there is so many. So I'm just going to give you like a short thing about each of the victims. So the first person that they found was actually a male and he was Joe Doe. Joe Doe. John Doe number one. They never identified him. He was emasculated and decapitated and his skin was treated with this chemical thing that sort of made his skin go like red and leathery and his head actually was recovered. A lot of the victim's heads were never uh, recovered. This person's was but he was still unidentified and so therefore John Doe number one. So victim number two was Edward Andrusy. And he was actually found at the same time as John Doe number one. So he was found about 30 feet away from John Doe. And same thing, he'd been decapitated and emasculated, but this time his head was recovered and that's why he was identified as being Edward. The third body they found was that of Florence Polio. She was female. She'd been dismembered as well as decapitated. But her head had never been recovered. They say it's suspected to have been Florence, but they can't 100% guarantee that it was. 
So John Doe number two was nicknamed the Tattooed Man. He obviously had tattoos and he had been decapitated as well, but this time it was proven that he was actually decapitated while still alive. So that was his cause of death. And his head actually was recovered, but still was unidentifiable. John Doe number three had the same thing happened. He was dismembered, decapitated, and his head was recovered. Uh, he was decapitated while alive as well, but also was still unidentified. John Doe number four was a little bit different. Only half of his torso was actually discovered. Nothing remained below the hips and his head was never found. Victim number seven was actually a Jane Doe this time, so she was female, and she was nicknamed the Lady of the Lake, and her head was never found either. Jane Doe number two was also decapitated. She was actually the only person of colour out of all of his victims, and for whatever reason she had a rib missing as well. Victim number nine was another John Doe, and his head was never found. After him was Jane Doe number three, and her upper thigh was actually seen floating down a river, which is a pretty scary sight to see. I don't know whether if I saw that I would even think it was real or whether it was a dummy or what, but her thigh was seen going down a river, which started an investigation, and then they found sort of like a burlap sack where they found a headless torso, a foot, and another thigh but she was never identified and her head was never found. After that was Jane Doe number four. Her head was discovered, but again was unable to be identified for whatever reason. And then John Doe number six was found at the same time and his head was found in a can. Which... I don't know how big of a can that must have been, unless it was um all fucked up, I don't know, but he was found in a can. So as you can see, most of these victims were just unidentified, which makes the whole thing seem so much worse. That just goes to show, honestly, how bad it really was in the 1930s where they, there was just nothing they could do. They had their heads, they had DNA and whatever, but it wasn't enough to identify these people, which is just crazy. But then I guess that's why the butcher picked drifters and people that were at the run because people weren't looking for them. So maybe no one even noticed. So the main suspect I mentioned earlier was Dr. Francis E. Sweeney. And he was actually a veteran of World War One, And he was actually part of a medical unit where they worked with amputees. So you can see why someone might think that someone with his expertise would have been able to be a suspect. Because if he were the murderer, he obviously knows what he's doing. So as I said, he was interviewed by Elliot Ness and he actually did two polygraph tests, but they were in the early stages of being created and they weren't very reliable, but Elliot claimed that he had failed both, which at the time was pretty full on evidence for them, because um, they obviously didn't have reason to believe that the polygraph tests were unreliable, they thought they were reliable, and so they thought this was like a huge piece of evidence. And so the person who actually conducted the polygraph test, he was famous for it, and he basically said, you've got your man, this is, this is the killer, this is the butcher. But because of the doctor's uh, relations to Ness's opposition, he basically felt that it would be impossible to actually prosecute him, and so he didn't. He actually had him committed instead. And so after he was committed, uh, there were no other leads or suspects whatsoever. But from his hospital confinement, he did send Elliot Ness multiple letters, notes, postcards, whatnot, uh, basically harassing him and taunting him, I guess you could say. Uh, and so that's why people to this day still believe that he was the butcher because there was no other leads after he'd been committed. 
he continually harassed Elliot Ness, which fair enough, if you were innocent, I, I mean, I probably wouldn't harass him because it's weird, but I can get why you would. So guys, my camera died. So basically that's the story of the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Uh, so let me know what you think about it down below, or you can message me over on Facebook at Skyweb with three Bs. Make sure to give this video a like if you feel like it, and subscribe so you can see all my videos I post every Thursday all about true crime. Bye.